like to thank all the organizers for this wonderful initiative and the colleagues from around the world that are exchanging experiences in this Encontro de Pianistas Costa Rica 2022. It is a great honor to be here interacting with you. I will present some aspects of Santoro's technique that may be associated with his readings and comprehension of the 1948 Second Progressist Composers Congress that was held in Prague and that settled the basis for an aesthetic called socialist realism. Santoro was the only Brazilian to attend and that completely changed his view about the socialist approach to music, therefore having dramatic implications to the nationalistic generation of the 40s in Brazil. I will briefly contextualize Santoro in the Brazilian composition panorama, discuss some issues about Marxist dialectics, including the rural-urban struggle perspective very strongly linked the more stream revolutionary movements in Brazil context in the 50s and 60s, and show some examples of his techniques in some works for piano in the 50s. In his first attempts at composition, Santoro freely used the combination of sounds and experimented with serialist techniques in his works. After his studies with Kohreuter in the 1940s, he embraced dodecaphonism, even though in an extremely personal way, this being his so-called atonal phase. Already in the decade of 50, influenced by his ideology and the nationalist movement that was still in force with great strength in Brazil, he decided to approach a language closer to folklore, without, however, an explicit use of folk material derived from his researches. The appropriation of the national vernacular was, before this moment, a procedure seldom used by the composer. Initially, he believed that 12-tone techniques introduced in the country by the German musician Hans Joachim Kohreuter would represent the new revolutionary ideal on Marxist basis. The absence of functional hierarchies, essential feature of this technique, could represent a strong analogy with the new humanist basis proposed by realism socialists, that the social equality and could become a vehicle for the universalization of music, another proposal of the current ideology. The moment of rupture and aesthetic reorientation, adopting the Genovese premises, took place specifically on his return to Brazil after the Second Congress of Composers of Prague which voted against the possibility of using atonal music among some of his works composed for piano representing the 50s, 60s, we can cite the first book of preludes, where the approximation and influence of music was so present that even two of them received lyrics by Brazilian relevant poet Vinicius de Moraes, becoming songs. The series Paulistanas, composed of seven pieces, where particularly the last, the composer himself, added the subtitle Sonata in One Movement, the Frevo, the Brazilian Dances, the Toccata, and the third and fourth piano sonatas. This nationalistic phase extends until the beginning of the 1960s, a period in which the composer again leaves the country. In the specific case of Santoro, his ideology and his aesthetic premises of the nationalists found in instrumental music a possibility of using a wide range of techniques and procedures that, not necessarily, would be conveniently employed in other categories such as opera or other genres of vocal music. One of the main features of vocal music was, of course, its immediate possibility, due to the semantic dimension present in the text, of representing the much-discussed positive character so essential for socialist realism. The text could much more easily conduct musical discourse to make explicit issues due to the socialist regime such as the victory of the proletariat of the bourgeois, mentioned by Santoro himself on the occasion of his commentary on his opera Zé Brasil. During his nationalistic period, Santoro displayed a strong tendency to recreate the socialist realism in his own way just as he approached atonalism. If in his discourse he unconditionally embraced the premises of the Second Prague Congress and Yezhdanov's positions, against progressives, and it is worth remembering that Santoro initially positioned himself much more in favor of using contemporary compositional resources, such as serialism, in his actual realization of music, he did not abdicate from using these resources by creating and deepening a nationalist language much more intellectual than could be expected. For instance, in Santoro's Piano Sonatas number no. 3 and 4, the form becomes more and more clear and less rhapsodic throughout the movements, the last two movements being extremely similar both in character and in texture and formal organization. 
For the use in these two works of a third movement that begins energetically and with a mechanical rhythm, ostinato, moves towards a lyrical theme and returns with the ostinato, now more vibrant, to culminate in a virtuosistic finale in the manner of a toccata. We can understand that the meaning of struggle and affirmation, the positive character, seems to be the meaning part of the play in accordance with the static premises of the socialist realism. It is a hermeneutic window, as would say Lawrence Kramer, opened by the repetition of a procedure and, in fact, supported by the author's own statement in relation to this third symphony. In this work I intended to do something with an authentic revolutionary sense, that is, to realistic content. The mechanical sense of the last movement has a symbolic reason, in the face of the proletarian class, which at this end presents itself in a dominating way only interrupting, suddenly, to give place to acquire in the brass, in a dojo's repose, to then be dominated by the previous theme, in the form of a, could the, to finish, my intention was to show the dominating power of the man of work, the vigor shown by the decisive rhythmical moments, and its constant, constructive movement, showing, however, with the sudden entrance of the adagio, in metals the collective feelings of the mass at rest between well-being and job. The composer's testimony allows us to establish an analogy. Santoro uses several sound metaphors to represent the positive content in his symphony, and naturally, this is a procedure that matures throughout the 50s. The analogy is established by the use of the same resources in an analogous context, that of the attempt to build a work compatible with the realistic premises, which is the case of the three works presented in this communication, in addition, of course, to the degree of success attributed to the procedure by the composer himself. The simple formal analysis of the work tells us nothing about this possibility, which, as again, Loris Kramer reminds us, is only one of the several interpretative possibilities that lie within the scope of the non-incorrect, given that if there is a misinterpretation, paradoxically, there is no single and exclusive correct interpretation. Unlike the Romantics and the later works of the classical period, the affirmation of tonality does not occur through the heroic overcoming of the tonic. The tonal question in Santoro, at least in the most traditional sense, seems to be transcended from work to work being replaced by formal organization and the character of intonation imposed by the music. Small thematic structures are opposed as a struggle in the first movement of the fourth piano sonata in a sequence only analogous to the sonata form. The structure is unclear, even allowing the possibility of different analytical interpretations of its form. From chaos to order, from the most complex to the simplest, this can be the key to contrasting motives and their gradual and immediate elaboration, a process that takes place throughout the entire first movement, reflecting on its formal organization. The order is imposed as the sections of the second and third movements become more clear and delimited. It is still remarkable how in this work we observe a clear division into two parts. The first with the stylized Brazilian rhythm theme, but totally original, and the second that contains the second and third movement, mixing original themes with derived from the folk song Terezinha de Jesus, a metaphor that may represent the overcoming of the capitalist system, chaos, to the socialist system, order. The chaos and the frantic attempt to organize can be represented by the presentation of contrasting motives and their gradual and immediate elaboration, a process that takes place throughout the entire first movement, reflecting on its formal organization. 
there is no longer any need to thematize the relevance of dialectics to Marxism, evidently referring to dialectical materialism, notably opposed to that proposed by Hegel of an idealistic character, nor of Marxism itself to the communism and the revolutionary process. The communist movement lacked a method of thought capable of interpreting reality manifested by particular facts and circumstances that are never the same, since, for this perspective of thought, history operates as a process. This tool, this method, must be essentially flexible in order to account for the fluid present in real life, in practice as an action arising from theory, because, as Vladimir Lenin stated, without revolutionary theory, there is no revolutionary practice. Dialectics is the great fundamental idea according to which the world should not be considered as a complex of finished things, but as a complex of processes in which things, apparently stable, as well as their intellectual reflections in our brain, the ideas undergo an uninterrupted change of becoming and decay, in which, finally, despite all the apparent failures and momentary setbacks, a progressive development ends up taking place today. Two. In relation to the movement and the transformation process itself, the following quote by Joseph Stalin contextualizes what we want to exemplify about dialectics from the perspective of Claudio Santoro's work. The dialectical method considers that no phenomenon of nature can be understood when viewed in isolation, outside the surrounding phenomena, because any phenomenon, no matter in what domain of nature, can be converted into nonsense when considered outside the conditions that surround it, when detached from these conditions. On the contrary, any phenomenon can be understood and explained when considered from the point of view of its indissoluble connection with the phenomena that surround it, when considered as it is, conditioned by the phenomena that surround it. We can identify in the Hegelian dialectic and also in the Marxist the three instances of the method, the thesis, the antithesis, and the synthesis. Thesis is understood as the initial statement from which an antithesis emanates, which is the negation of contradiction. Finally, the synthesis emerges due to the confrontation of thesis and antithesis, class struggle, and by itself it becomes the new thesis to be refuted by a new antithesis arising from its negation or contradiction, in a virtually infinite process. For Marx, this end would be the definite suppression of the social classes. However, if a synthesis becomes a new thesis, it would be possible to understand the dialectical method with pure negation and, in a certain way, tautological. Two factors must be considered. One of the reflection of Stalin already mentioned, as the thesis is now under the action of a new environment, being confronted with an antithesis of a different order of its genesis. The original thesis and another, the logical operation derived from the negation of the negation and expressed mathematically by the positive or negative logical operator. Thus, negation of negation as the affirmation of the affirmation is positive, since negative with negative in the multiplication, in the confrontation, see the operator A versus B, results in positive, while negative with positive, thesis versus antithesis, antithesis results in negative. This is the movement necessary for the revolutionary project present in the negation of the negation itself, which for Talmayer it's something positive. Yet, it is worth mentioning that the dialectical method is not only limited to being the simple confrontation of two opposite things. We must here invoke the concept of aporia, where these opposites are irreconcilable. Aristotle defines aporia as which deals with the equality of contradictory conclusions, being, therefore, inappropriate to generate the necessary movement in the dialectic of overcoming. Precisely for this reason, because it is not an arbitrary or random mixture of opposites, dialectics allows movement through the negations of negations. For dialectics, there is nothing definitive, absolute sacred. Its presence, the obsolences of all things, and in all things, and, for her, nothing exists but the uninterrupted process of becoming and the transitory. Therefore, it is important not to confuse aporia with dialectics. We may then infer, since dialectics presents itself as something much more complex than the mere confrontation of thesis and antithesis, that there are fundamental laws that govern it. This can be stated as reciprocal action, polar unity, or everything relates.
dialectical change, negation of negation, or everything changes. Transition from quantity to quality of qualitative change. Interpretation of opposites, contradiction, or struggle of opposites. Still, this loss can be defined by Reciprocal action, dialectical change, and transition from quantity to quality unlike metaphysics, which conceives the world as a set of static things. Dialectics understands it as a set of processes. According to Stalin, in opposition to metaphysics, dialectics considers the process of development not as a simple process of growth in which quantitative changes do not become qualitative changes but as a development that passes from insignificant and latent quantitative changes to apparent and radical changes, qualitative changes. Sometimes, qualitative changes are not gradual, but rapid, sudden, and operate by leaps of a state. The transition from quantity to quality occurs when, in the confrontation between thesis and antithesis, the qualities of the thesis are radically transformed. When heated, a liquid can, to a certain extent, remain a liquid, but when the temperature reaches its boiling point for those given pressure conditions, it turns into a gas, the synthesis resulting from the action of antithesis on the thesis. Interpenetration of opposites, considering that all reality is movement, and that movement, being universal, assumes quantitative and qualitative forms necessarily linked to each other, and that transform into each other, the question that arises is. What is the engine of change and, in particular, the transformation of quantity into quality, or from one quality to a new one? Pulitzer, citing Stalin, indicate that, in opposition to metaphysics, dialectic starts from the point of view that the objects and phenomena of nature presuppose internal contradictions because they all have a negative side and a positive side. A past and a future all have elements that disappear and elements that develop. The struggle of these opposites, the struggle between the old and the new, between what dies and what is born, between what perishes and what evolves, it is the internal content of the development process of the conversion of quantitative changes into qualitative changes. By taking contradiction as the seminal principle of the dialectical movement, we can infer that Contradiction is internal, all reality is movement, and there is no movement that is not the consequence of a struggle of opposites of its internal contradiction, that is, the essence of the considered movement and not external to it. Example, the plant arises from the seed, and its appearance implies the disappearance of the seed. This happens with all reality. If it changes, it is because it is, in essence, something different from it. It is internal contradictions that generate the movement and development of things. The contradiction is innovative. It is not enough to verify the internal character of the contradiction. It is also necessary to emphasize that this contradiction is the struggle between the old and the new, between what dies and what is born, between what perishes and what develops. Example, it is in the child and against him that the teenager grows up, it is in the adolescent and against him that the adult matures, there is no victory without fight. The dialectician knows that, where a contradiction develops, there is fecundity, there is the presence of the new, the promise of its victory. Unity of opposites, the contradiction contains two terms that are opposed, for this, it must be a unity, the unity of opposites. Examples, there is, in a day, a period of light, and a period of darkness, it can be a 12-hour day, and a 12-hour night, therefore, Day and night are two opposites that exclude each other, which does not prevent them from being equal and constituting the two parts of the same 24-hour day. On the other hand, in nature there is rest and movement, which are contrary to each other. For the physicist, however, rest is a kind of movement, and, conversely, movement can be considered as a kind of rest. Therefore, there is unity between contraries, presenting them in their indissoluble unity. This unity of opposites, this reciprocal connection of opposites, takes on a particularly important meaning when, at a given moment in the process, the opposites become one another. The unity of opposites is conditioned, temporary, transient, relative. The struggle of opposites, which mutually exclude each other, is absolute, as development and movement are absolute. With the end of the Vargas era in Brazil, the beginning of Juscelino Kubitschek's government in the mid-50s of the 20th century, the country plunged into a cycle of dependent development because of the difficulty of the fragile national bourgeois class to sustain the industrialization process, initiated in a period of autonomous capitalist development.
the state starts to assume a greater density and complexity in the face of the new demands of the market and international capital that impose the developmental paradigm as synonymous with industrialization, growth of the domestic market, and a civilizing social project. These issues were openly discussed on a more universal spectrum at the Second Congress of Progressive Composers held in 1948 in Prague, whose only Brazilian musician present, as we have already mentioned, was Claudio Santoro. In any case, certain themes, including those that guided the realization of this Congress, in addition to the definitions of Stalinist policies of education, propaganda and mainly culture, known as socialist realism, were already a matter of order a few years before the Congress, such as we can see in the following quote from Mikhail Karin, a leading member of the Politburo in 1945. The workers and peasants of our country are ready to hand everything over to the Soviet power, let us therefore apply all our energies to enrich and enlighten the workers of our country even more intensely with the ideals of Marxism-Leninism. It is worth noting that the socialist realist project dates from the 1920s, still under the Leninist ages, therefore prior to Stalinist Zhdanovism, when it will have greater influence on music. Education, culture, in short, everything should be at the service of the revolutionary project. Therefore, it is essential to spread the revolutionary message and the teaching of Marxism-Leninism through all available means. Art, as we already know, even through the experiences of the Middle Ages carried out by the Church, was one of the best vehicles for such an endeavor. Questions that, until the present moment, of course updated, are still central to the revolutionary movement such as the opposition between the countryside and the sea, rural versus urban, the revolution coming from the peasants, present even in our recent history, particularly by the Araguaia guerrilla project in Brazil, were evidently thematized, leading the militants to an intense debate on the concept of the national versus international capital and the rural and urban industrialization versus submission to the international capital in the Latin American contest see experience of the Cuban Revolution and Brazil. In 1947, the national leadership of the Brazilian Communist Party published the Periodical Problems, which would be the main theoretical organ of the party in those years. Its print run reached 8,000 copies, and in July 1948, the Communists from Sao Paulo launched Fundamentos, a modern culture magazine. They resisted until the mid-50s, when the Communist movement broke down. Santoro already published in August 1948 his article Problems of Brazilian Contemporary Music in Face of the Resolutions and Appeal of the Prey Congress of Composers in Fundamentals Periodical. From the very name of this article, the proposal of this text can be already be perceived, and the magazine was open to the discussion of this theme, being an integral part of its education project. Here is another example of Claudio Santoro's connection with the Brazilian Communist Party section. It is possible to perceive a clear line of concerns of film critics and directors throughout the history of Brazilian cinema, defining what Brazil is. To this extent, the first Brazilian films from the 10th to the 1930s, mainly, reflect the need to differentiate themselves from foreign films, looking for our things or by copying the language of the foreigner movies, try to translate this in terms of approaching our themes, field equal to Brazilianists. This is how rural features remain hegemonic despite some isolated attempts to portray urban themes. When themes related to the cities are dealt with, the main objective is to exalt their organization and beauty as the index of civility. This is what constitutes the cosmopolitan approach city equals to civilization. Even though the author refers to the cinema produced in Brazil until the 30s of the 20th century, he himself further on indicates that this position also applies to the two following decades, the second fifties of the 20th century temporal delimitation of our work. With the emergence of the so-called cinema novel, the situation does not change immediately, since a precursor film such as The Great Moment in the history of cinema of this period represents a practically isolated initiative. Furthermore, the entire first phase of cinema novel following a kind of tacit agreement with the Instituto Superior de Estudos Brasileiros, turned to rural things, criticizing inequalities in a developmental and bourgeois horizon, 
Naturally, the Brazilian artist class, then deeply engaged in the leftist movement, immediately tried to thematize the issue, materializing it in works of Brazilian cinema and music, as well as other arts and literature. The choice of these themes was not random. In a context of a peripheral capitalist country, the question of the rural and the urban takes on important ideological contours. This can be said since the act of thinking about these themes refers to projects for the construction of nationality, which ultimately can have repercussions on the analysis of Brazilian insertion in the aforementioned capitalist context, whether the commentators are aware of it or not. Therefore, when taking or talking about the representations of rural or urban in Brazilian cinema, these critics interfered in the political ideological struggle in which they were inserted. If on the one hand, in the cinema, the rural theme should be the one that would most genuinely be associated with the supposed Brazilianness, by replicating and faithfully portraying the habits, speeches, and customs, on the other hand, the cosmopolitan aspired to represent Brazil in the perspective of the so-called world, European, civilized, updating the country with the industrialization process and the growth of an internal market only identifiable with the urban area. This gives rise to the construction of the rural urban opposition as a central theme of the national art of the 1950s, which will be dealt with the music of Claudio Santoro in a more profound way, without the accurate folklore reproduction and without the recurrent use of the appropriation of folk music as foundation of the creative process. On the contrary, Santoro, by understanding more deeply the Soviet proposal, theoretically based on the concept of positive music and intonazia, aims to transmute the symbolic elements present in the folkloric and urban imaginary through the dialectical thought, through the practical application claimed by Lenin, Stalin, and Kalinin of Marxism. This is the essence, the compositional process to be present in the Paulistanas of 1953, and in particular in the Paulistana No. 1. Within the educational and propagation propaganda project of the revolutionary message that represented Judanovism, the official cultural doctrine of the Soviet Communist Party, Santoro was forced to create new forms of musical thought and organization in the typically national form, in addition to rhetorical figures, characteristics through a new and particular symbolism. Among them, what we here call the dialectical process of composition, the process described in the composition of the Paulistana No. 1. It was evident that the other arts were to a greater or lesser degree engaged in the revolutionary process, being propagandists of the communist revolution, and that Santoro's dialogue with the other artists provided him with subsides to apply in his craft music. Probably the cinema, for which Santoro wrote several soundtracks, served as a more clear example for him to transpose the urban-rural theme. 
negation of negation or double negation represents, as we have exposed the principle of dialectics, not the reestablishment of the primitive affirmation thesis, but the overcoming in the context of the passage from quantity to quality. We can then, from the analysis carried out, conclude that in the case of the Pauli standard number one for piano by Claudio Santoro, the pentatonic scale of black keys that would be the initial primitive thesis when appearing again in the closing gesture does so but through the qualitative leap and as a pentatonic synthesis with the tonal system, a pentatonic not composed only by the black keys, but by the addition of the sixth and ninth over a tonic over one of the icons of the tonal system. The process of double negation engenders new properties, new forms that paradoxically extinguish and maintain characteristics of their thesis and antithesis. At two levels, we observe the negation and transformation of the thesis, the first at the level of the structure as a whole, where the antithesis is highlighted by having a specific thematic area, different from the thematic area of the thesis. This generates the sensation, when analyzing only the formal surface characteristics of the pieces, that it is a binary form, roughly it is. However, there is a clarification of the process, an identification of the dialectical materialist composition method when we realize that the thematic areas representative of mood and tonality in opposition rural versus urban are synthesized in the final chord. On the second level, smaller in size, we perceive the internal contradictions within the modal area, where at first tetrachord, with a distinct sound and nature from the following two, presents itself as the thesis to be denied as it contains in itself the symbolic of the pentatonic scale, which, followed by the two other tetrachords clearly identifiable as tertials, at the same time generates and contains in itself its synthesis. The diatonic collection that most contains the pentatonic thesis formed by the black keys, that of D-flat ionic, a mode that is established by the reasons already discussed, Considering all these points, we can infer that this little piece is a living example of the creative application of Marxism-Leninism, so-called by Lenin, Kalin, and Stalin, as do the other works behave the same way with the use of a contrast between white and black keys, pentatonic, and tonal material.